Facebook. Um, salutare tuturor! Uh, numele meu este Mario Tudor și astăzi avem uh, live pe pagina uh, F64 um, un webinar dedicat uh, unui subiect destul de important pentru mine, dar și cred că și pentru invitatul meu de astăzi, invitatul nostru de astăzi, invitatul F64 de astăzi, uh, Richard Homan. Tema este ce înseamnă o fotografie bună, da? ce definește o fotografie bună. Nu neapărat. Richard este un fotograf de nuntă, l-am cunoscut prin intermediul Facebook-ului și prin intermediul comunităților de fotografi internaționale acum câțiva ani. Am rămas prieteni buni, am împărțit experiențe împreună, am fotografiat împreună și mă bucur să-l am alături din nou, pentru că uh, în vară a fost, uh, pentru prima dată în România, a fost invitat să vorbească la, uh, la Wetcamp, una dintre cele mai importante conferințe dedicate fotografiei de nuntă din uh, România. I-a plăcut foarte mult. Uh, mi-a zis că vrea să revină în România și am găsit o oportunitate destul de, de repede. Uh, F64 a dorit să-l aibă aici. Le-a plăcut foarte mult prezentarea de la, de la Mare, de la Mamaia. Și uh, astăzi îl am alături de mine. Richard este unul dintre cei mai importanți fotografi de, de nuntă din Marea Britanie, un fotograf premiat internațional, uh, dar pe lângă asta e un om deosebit, un om cu suflet mare și uh, mă bucur să uh, să am astăzi aici. Salutare, Richard! Hello! <laughs> Hi, Hi Rich, how are you? I'm really well, how are you? How do you find Bucharest? Because you've been to to Romania this summer. They make the best mojitos. That's what I found out. So you you, you came to Romania for mojitos? Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I heard there was a really good after party. So um, I just did a short presentation of you, a short description of uh, you. And uh, I, th I told to the audience you are for the, fir for the second time in Romania. And we are happy to have you here. Oh, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> So um, today's theme, um, to our discussion theme is about um, how would you define um, a great photo, not, not only regarding wedding photography, but mm. a good photo generally. So what? S simple question. Then, simple yeah. question, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> how, how would you, how do you so, define yeah. a good okay. photo? Well, first off, um, the technical side we covered earlier in the day. I know other people have done that. So for me, the things which are important um, particularly within the sphere of wedding photography, is a connection with people. Um, if you haven't got a connection with people, um, the couple, the, the guests, uh, the other suppliers, uh, the venue staff, all of those people, um, they all help enable you and they create the environment for you to actually create what I would broadly describe as good images. So if you don't have this environment uh, in order to get great photos, how, would you, how, how do you deal with the things when you don't have all the things you need yeah. to, to get the best photo. So, so there's, there's, there's good photos, then there's great photos, and then there's exceptional work. Gra and then there's groundbreaking work, if you like. So let's start from the premise that we're all happy being okay. And okay is just okay. Now we can go beyond that, we can be good, and then we can produce really good work. But really, I like to think that we should all be striving for something a little bit more. Um, a, a deeper connection, better composition, beautiful light, whatever it is that, that fires you off as a photographer. Uh, for me, it's just this connection with people, but, and, and I will forgive all my other faults as long as I am able to um, achieve that aim. But I think, if yeah, if you, you've got to build that connection. Um, so there are some ways in which I do it. Um, you, you can't always have excellence in everything, but you can strive for it. You can strive to try and build those relationships before the wedding and throughout the day, um, which create the conditions, uh, the environmental conditions, the social conditions for you to be able to achieve closeness and trust uh, with the couple, the guests and the suppliers and the venue staff and everybody else that's there and the people you're working with, like you and me work together. So if you can achieve that, that's, that's a great base That's a great point from which to start. So, um, do you think the technique, controlling the technique, is is really important uh, in order to get the best photos? Because I, I believe you you have to know your camera before uh, starting to think how to get how to take great great pictures, right? Completely. Yeah. The technic the technical element, uh, learning your craft, understanding your equipment, um, how to use it in every every single condition available. Um, 
You can learn that in the classroom, but really it comes with experience. Um, and that's experience learned in a variety of situations over a number of years. So um, how often do you, do you go outside your house to take pictures except the weddings? So um, uh, I've learned in the past that um, um, in order to get the, um, the amount of experience you need to take great pictures, you have to go out and exper experiment all the time. Yeah. How, how often do you go outside to take different pictures than the wedding picture? Less often than I should, if I'm honest. I should go out more, I should, I should do what I preach. Um, years ago I used to go out a lot more. Um, I'd go out into the street, um, into the world. Um, it started probably at university when I was painting, um, and I started looking into myself. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of painters, certainly students do this, when they're searching for a subject, you start looking inwards. And I was given some very good advice, which was if you keep looking inside yourself, it ultimately leads nowhere. So this started me searching, searching the world. I started looking outside of myself. I started with direct, observa direct observation drawing um, and building on that. And that built into painting work. And then that built into multimedia work with photography and painting being used together. That then developed into pure photography. So that's kind of how my journey began. And so yeah, you, you need to look at yourself. You need to go and, um, I say you need to, I need to, you need to. We need to go and outside of our normal sphere, outside of those controlled, paid, client-driven environments, and, and test and play and, and work things out creatively, um, and fail constantly, and try and work out what works and what doesn't. How often do you, fa do you fail? Because uh, I remember your presentation at WetCamp was about You're not going to make me failing. cry. Don't make me cry. No, I, I won't. I won't. <laughs> so how, how often, um, how many times do you, do you fail before, get, before to get the best frame, the, the frame you want to, to deliver to your client? Sure. Well, sometimes it's a total failure. Sometimes, and I was thinking this the other night, I was culling a wedding where I worked with a second shooter. Um, I hate that phrase, by the way. I, I worked with um, a, part, <laughs> a, friend. a partner photographer, a, a friend. Partner. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and um, we shot between this maybe 20, 21,000 images. And I was culling through them. And I got to the part where we were working at night, maybe 12, between 12 and 1 o'clock in the morning, and we were trying to set up a creative portrait that I had this amazing concept for in my head suddenly, which involved a number of hands and lights and off-camera flash. And we must have wasted half an hour on that. So, <laughs> so, and we never did the shot because I had to call it. I spent 25 minutes, I looked at it, I said, no. This is, I persevered with it, I did believe in it, I pushed it, but I pushed it as far as I'm... And really ch should should have, and actually, it's not really that great. Shot anyway. um, <laughs> so, be, so I fail all the time. Being here in Romania, um, after I moved to London, I realized um, there are two different markets, but the weddings are still the same. The people are still the same. And here in Romania, I was afraid to fail. I was afraid to uh, spend thirty minutes to take a pictures a picture. Sorry. Um, so, how do you manage this fear about uh, wasting, like wasting, like thirty minutes of the couple's time um, from the couple's time without getting anything? Sure. So, in because that, yeah, I, I'm yeah. pretty sure they will ask you. We, uh, we've been there for thirty minutes, and ah. uh, we tried to take a picture. So where, where's our picture? They weren't there. They weren't there. They weren't there. So, I approach. Uh, I have a structured approach to a wedding, uh, which I've learned and developed. So it helps me relax and it helps me be calm and happy and know what I'm doing when. So I do daylight creative portraits. Um, I go out in ambient light and I create very natural, very relaxed, um, very romantic portraits of them in daylight. So what, and, then, and then I go out again, I might do some sunset things, I go out again at night um, where I can play with abstract shapes, I can use the darkness of the environment to my um, to my benefit and start creating more abstract uh, portraits. And that's when we went to do that. But before I bring the client out, I might spend anything up to half an hour setting up two or three creative portraits before they even come anywhere near me. Because I don't want to waste their time. It's their wedding day. I know I've really got the day in the bag. And yes, I probably am missing a few moments, um, which, which I would like to do. But uh, for me, I'm known for creative portraits and real moments. So I need to be able to deliver, deliver both of those things. And it's setting them up before the client comes along, before I go and get them, then all they've got to do is walk in. And at that time of night, they're going to be useless anyway. Yeah, so <laughs> so I, I know because we, we, we've been working like yeah. for a few, few weddings together and um, um, 
I know you have a plan before taking them out. Mm. Uh, you go and you go outside and you search the surroundings. Mm. You scout the place just before calling them out, and you don't waste your, you don't waste their time because they want to go up, uh, back to the party. Yeah. So how how uh, how how do you deal with your most important clients? Most important. Most important. They're all important. They are all important. They're all important. They're all equally important whether it's the royal family or the woman down the road um, who I've known for two years, they're all important. It's, it's, it's their day, um, it's their story. I'm just there to, to facilitate um, gathering that story together, really. That's how I see my role. Um, so in terms of importance, I could talk about how I, how I deal with any client, but um, I think they're all important. Everyone's important. Yeah, so uh, how, how do they perceive the, the, the best pictures? Uh, how, how do they perceive a good picture? A good picture? Oh, I've no idea. It's a nightmare. They change all the time. You've got clients who have um, an idea of what they want in one respect. It's then up to you to try and sort of cajole and educate and understand from them exactly what it is that drives them. And I always say to them, I'm just honest with them. Why, why me? Why me? Have you had a good look at my portfolio? Have you a good look at my work? Did you look through those three complete weddings I showed you? And if you did, what was it you loved and what was it you hated and why? And actually, I'm not too worried about the why. As long as they can just point and grunt, you know, I didn't like that, yeah, I love that. It gives me a, enough of an idea to start building a way forward with them. Now, that is kind of secondary to my relationship with them. Um, really, what I want to do is connect with them. And the funny thing about that, of course, is that you're only connecting with two people and you could do a really good job of that. You could meet with them two or three times. You could discuss it. You could be on the same punctuation mark of the same line of the same page. But still, you go to the wedding and the other two or 300 guests, you, so haven't, you haven't had that with them. So that's where the fun begins. So do you plant, uh, we say like we plant seeds before going to take pictures uh, during the wedding day. Have you had an experience before in the past, like you went to the wedding and you met the couple for the first time during the wedding day. Yeah, I've done that too. And oh, how do you feel? That's great fun too. <laughs> because, because from my experience, yeah. I know you, you, you waste like one hour, two hours yeah. to, to build that, that trust, to build a connection, and it's really hard to, to get there in the wedding day. So um, is it hard? Is it easy? It depends, as I'm sure you know. It depends on the couple. I'm quite open, and I have to then accelerate my relationship with them because I haven't met them before. Um, I might have spoken to them maybe once on the phone. I, and you do get people who just want to book you like that. They say, we love your work, turn up and do your thing. I, I'm not a fan of that. I like to make sure that I have an understanding of them and I can invest myself in the things that they want and the things that are important to them um, in, in, in a good way, in a thoughtful way, in a considered way, um, and not just turn up and do it. Don't get me wrong though, there is something to be said for a pure documentary approach where you're completely disconnected, if you like, from your subject. The story is about what's in front of you. But within the genre of wedding photography, within this history and this tradition that we work within, it's all very well for us to say that. But the guests, um, everyone else within the wedding, isn't necessarily on your same, if you like, I don't want to use the word, <laughs> it sounds snobbery, but on that same wavelength. Um, so it's important that you respect where they're coming from and what they want. Um, so just turning up and, and saying, yeah, I'm a documentary photographer, I'm not going to shoot the groups, I'm not going to shoot the portraits, I'm just going to shoot what happens, because that's how I roll, you know. I'm going to wait for the moments, I'm going to compose, look for good light and shoot. You know, it's not, always, it's not always practical within the genre and traditions of what your clients and their guests expect. So, um, do you claim you are uh, a, document, a pure documentary wedding photographer, or you are just a wedding photographer? No, I think, first, first, first of all, I think I'm a human being who captures some stories sometimes. Um, I'm, not a business, I'm not even a very good businessman, to be honest. I fail at everything. Yeah, I, I, know. <laughs> this, 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 I, I want this to be the next question. So do you invest most of your time building relationship with people, or do you spend most of your time investing, um, investing in, business, business, in your business, yeah. uh, learning tricks, how to get your yeah. clients close to your... Uh, well, I think my accountant would love it if I did the latter. My accountant would be quite happy if I spent more time on the business. But it doesn't drive me. I could do 101 other things which make a lot more money than this. Um, so the reason I do this, the reason I stepped out of my career in marketing, the reason I left the armed forces um, was because I was craving something. There was something in me which needed a connection to people. I needed a risk. 
I needed a challenge. And I wrote all of these things down and I worked out what career paths they might involve and it came out to be wedding photography. And it, that's what I do and that's what I love. And that's why it drives me. So this is the reason you are doing wedding photography for people. You are not driven by um, money, getting more money from... Uh... There is something here, if I'm honest. When I first started, this was 10 years ago, I was driven by ego. I was driven by people saying, oh, isn't that a wonderful image? Oh, Richard, aren't you fantastic? And it has taken time to brush that away and to look for the real things, the, the ego. important things. The ego, yeah. um, the, yeah, and that whole approach. Um, everything which is wrapped up in that, from the things you wear to the way you are with people, um, to an approach which is driven by hoping for um, acceptance or, or um, a positive response from the guests and from the people. Don't get me wrong, I do want that too, um, but I want it now for them, not for me. Do you think um, you noticed an improvement in your work after removing your ego? Um, yeah, uh, it became more honest. Um, it, it's funny actually, when you take away some things like that, you find, you find that, or I found, that my, the honesty in my work came out, the true subject, the true approach came out. Um, and I know you were going to talk at some point about awards and so on, we didn't mention awards. Um, <laughs> If you're shooting, I was shooting because I wanted to be accepted. I wanted for someone to tell me I was good. And what better place than other photographers, other amazing photographers to say, wow, look at your work. Um, I now am much more driven by the people around me. Um, but don't get me wrong, it's nice to win awards. And don't, you know, if you shouldn't be put off, I've learned a lot by doing that. Um, if I were to one day secretly, and this is never going out, to show you my first, my first submissions to some of the quite important global awards, you would laugh your head off. Um, so yeah, my approach has changed completely and, and awards help you with that. They help you grow and they help you learn. Um, they push you hard because you, you're trying to achieve something, but it's, it's important to remain that you don't do it for the wrong reasons. Um, and that's hard too, because we all live in the same world. We all need to pay our mortgage. We all need to live and eat. So um, yeah, business and money does have an, an impact, but I'm fortunate that I've got enough of uh, a client base, if you like, enough of a, an impact within my, with my business environment that I don't have to work too hard. So we've just found like two of the ingredients that um, makes a good, a, a good photo, like honesty mm. and being close to the people, right? You said you want to... This is what makes it good for me. For you. For me. Yeah. My clients... No, for, for, me, for me as well. So I believe, <laughs> I believe honesty and cre yeah. uh, trying to... Uh, create um, a good um, uh, a good relationship with your mm. clients, um, or not, not not only the clients because we are not talking only about wedding photography mm. with your subjects. So honesty and trying to create a good relationship with your uh, with your subjects mm. in order to help you to take a good photo. Right? What well, else? But that's only for you, because remember that your clients and their guests. May have may, may not be interest, so interested in that. They may be interested, and I'm going to say it in the more superficial. They might be interested in the chair covers and the dress and um, how the napkins are folded, and they might be interested in that kind of detail. Um, now, to me, that's not it's not hugely the reason I go out the door in the morning to do this, but it's hugely important to them. Um, so you mustn't neglect um, why your clients have booked you. They might have booked you because they've been seduced by colour or a particular image or a beautiful composition or the fact you've worked well in a certain venue, but you've got to then drill down and work out from your client, extract from them what they really are after. So how, how often do you, um, do you, do so you please your clients? I mean, well, if, if, I'm ask, I'm, if I'm your client right now and I'm asking you, I'm coming to you with a list of, mm. of shots I want, what would you do? Okay, so this happened last week. Last week. I'm not going to say last week because that identified right. Let's go back in the last month. <laughs> so they come to me with a list. Now, I've already met with them. They know I've got some rules. I've got some advice that helps them um, to do with group portraits. I have a number. Don't go over seven. You don't want your day turning into a wedding photo shoot. You want it to be a wedding day and you want to enjoy it in a natural way. So when they come to you with a number of requests, um, yeah, you want to accommodate them, but you might have to just think about logistically how you can fit those in. And then you might say to them, okay, but how important is this to you? Because you said you want to go off in that carriage for half an hour. You want us to follow you and take photographs. I said, that's really beautiful. We can probably do that in five minutes, if you know, on this particular stretch, and then we can get back because your guests are going to be having a great time while you're away. 
and would you like to see some of that? Would you like to see some of that part of the story? Um, you know, the kitchens are going to be producing the food. Um, all sorts of things are going to be going on in the venue. You, you know, is that important to you, or would it be more important to you that we're with you? And then they go, oh, we haven't thought of that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think my mum's doing something. She's putting the wedding cake together. And it's oh, fantastic. So maybe we could, we could be there as well. Yeah. So, Ch Ch um, Vlad, do, do we have to go out? Yeah. In the, okay. Are we on the move? So we, we, have, we have to go in the mime hall. So we'll continue <laughs> there because people That's want you right. to see. Yeah, okay. Say, cheers. Rock. Cheers. Here we go. <laughs> So we will go to the mine hall. Is this the Empire State? Grab some water. Grab some water. What? What's yeah. gonna happen? Is there you, you may need some water. So, uh, blood. Just make it hot. One second. Rich. Okay. So, um, we will continue with the next two, two questions about the. Thank you. Remaining active, 
moving fast. I'm, I will give up composition, I will give up the colour, I will give up anything to do with the structure of the image as long as I can capture a moment. And for me, one of the most important things is speed. I need to be where the action is before it happens. Um, or if I'm seeing it happen, I need to get there fast and capture it. And I, I'll, I'll compromise anything for that. Which probably, after all the talks you've had so far about what makes a good image, kind of throws a lot of that out the window. And don't get me wrong, it's really important, but I will, I will compromise all of that for, for one moment, for one emotion, um, for a connection with another human being, just for a second. How, how do you manage to make yourself invisible? Because um, in order to get those frames, uh, in Romania it, it happens like this. If you go with your camera close here, uh, next to your subject, they, 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 they stop doing what they do, they look like this at the camera. How, how do you make yourself invisible in order to get those emotions? Like, like this. So I follow my camera. Oh, oh no, that's the point. Okay, we'll pretend, okay? So here I am, six foot three, dressed in black. At the wedding, you're quite tall actually. And um, they all look at me and I say, I'm not here. <laughs> <laughs> but you are. But I am. But what it does is, it breaks down that straight away. When you meet someone new, if I come and, come and sit with them for a minute, if I was to just come and sit, straight away people are on the edge. This guy here, he's huge. <laughs> so straight away, if we just have a laugh, just make a gesture, just touch him for a second. Before I even start taking photographs, look at him, relax, look at him, relax. He's even smiling. He probably doesn't even know what I'm saying, but he's, he's smiling. Or we're doing a selfie. <laughs> and straight away, you've broken down a barrier. Now, once you've broken down that barrier, you don't have to do that bit again because he's got other things to do. He's listening, he's writing, he's writing notes or whatever he's doing on his phone. So he'll relax. And when he's relaxed, then I can work. So. Communicating with your subject is really important, making yourself pleasant, okay, right? I'm not, not trying, no, I'm not trying to make myself pleasant, I'm not trying to be something I'm not, I'm just going to be me. I know, because, because for me it's really hard, I'm not, I, I don't have the same personality like yours, so... You too. You're a big old teddy bear, I love you. <laughs> so, uh, it takes time for me to, to get comfortable close to my subject, yeah. so sometimes I believe being present there all the time makes myself invisible. So I'm not like uh, you going here and hey buddy, how are you? Before starting taking pictures. I'm just sitting here, I will come back and that's, that's fine too. That's, that's fine too. This is just what works for me. Don't be worried, don't go out and think this is what you have to do. And what works for you will work for you. Um, for me though, I used to, years ago, I think I maybe used to be a bit, what we just say is cheesy, a bit, oh, well, you know, I'm a wedding photographer, maybe ten years ago, I'd be like, oh, I'm here to photograph a wedding. I'm, I'm much more relaxed, much more myself now, and it's not about me, it's about them. If you take yourself away, if you throw your ego away, and just focus on what's important for them, what's important for you, 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 everybody who's at the wedding, um, the bride and groom are fairly easy to look after, because you've already met them, you had a meeting with them, you might have spoken to them a couple of times, and that's great. You've got them on board and they love you. But the other 200 guests didn't get that email. So you're right back to square one, and that, that's how I do it. I put myself unapologetically in the room, close to them, and I start breaking down those barriers. And humour is a good way to, humour is a good thing to use. Humour can be a double edged sword, because it can go two ways. Sometimes I think I'm funny, and Marius says I'm not. <laughs> so it can go two ways. So it's humour and touch. If you notice when I sat down next to this man there, you know, we were just talking, we were just touching, you know, it's like, hey, how's it going? And it's not, I'm not trying to be your best friend, but I'm just saying it's okay. I'm going to be this close to you. This is where I'm going to be, and, and this is okay. This is what I'm doing. I do this all the time. You're going to be all right. I'm not, trying, I'm not trying to embarrass you. And I'll say that to people. If people are worried, I'm not trying to embarrass you. This isn't, I'm not trying to catch you out. I'm just trying to capture a story. Um, if you're uncomfortable, just let me know. And that's fine, that's fine too. And then they relax, because they know you're not trying to do something weird. That's, that's my other website. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you got contacts with the Romanian humor um, this summer. What's the difference between Romanian humor and British humor? <laughs> One word, honesty. Romanians laugh if it's actually funny. 
but British people will laugh, whatever. And then, and then afterwards they'll go, that wasn't very funny, was it? We won't be coming here again. So, honesty. And that was the, um, that was the advice I was given before coming on to Wear Camp, just be, be yourself. So it fitted me quite well, because I love to think that's what I do anyway. Honesty. If you are about to shoot a Romanian wedding, what would you do differently than shooting your wedding in UK, outside UK? A specifically Romanian wedding. Okay, because I, I, we all, me and Gabriel already told you how a Romanian wedding is, so knowing that, what would you do differently? So Romanian weddings, are they hard work? Yeah. yeah. Are they long hours? Really long hours. And is there a thing called a horror? It just goes on and on and on. Some of them, yeah, it just goes on forever. I did actually do a little Romanian wedding in Amsterdam a few years ago with Gabriel. And, and it was punishingly hard. It went on forever. And I said, this is a you know, it's sort of one o'clock in the morning now. I think it's time I've got my beauty sleep. <laughs> and Gabby was, no, 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 no. This, this will go on until about five or six a.m. <laughs> so, what would I do? I would bring two more photographers because I get really tired really quickly because I get, I'm a bit fat. So uh, this is, no seriously, this is important. I would bring um, people who speak the language. Well, if I was off to Italy, I would work with an Italian photographer. Um, if I was off to, I don't know, Romania, we'd bring, we'd bring, we'd work together. Um, so I bring someone who understands the culture and the language and who is also brilliant at what they do. Um, because I'm not an island, I don't work alone, I never work alone, I always work with, um, I hate this phrase, second photographer. I'm going to change that now, let's all call it a friend. A photographer friend. A photographer friend, let's just use that. Because I like to think we're working for the same reasons, on the same mission. We're not doing, they're not secondary to me, there's no hierarchy really. Um, they need my help, I need their help, so let's get rid of that word now. Let's, let's get rid of that, there we go. <laughs> So it, it is like teamwork, right? You said you never work alone. But when I met you, you said you never second shot for another photographer. And then this year you, you started. How do you find the experience as a second photographer? As a, being a friend photographer, photographer friend. <laughs> so I realized that I was missing something. Um, I was busy and I always had lots of work on and I always liked working with my photographer friend. But I was envious of the way in which they were working. And I knew that I needed to do some of that for myself. So I stopped taking some bookings for my own weddings and started doing just a few uh, second photographer friend jobs. <laughs> and it allowed me a freedom, um, taking off the, sort of the shackles of having to do some of the work which is expected of you. Um, sort of group portraits or cakes or any of the other stuff which we, we still work within a tradition. Much as we want to throw it all away, we still work within a tradition. And our clients do expect a lot of that. So even if you want to expose man's inhumanity to man um, on the battlefields of Western Europe, you still need to, when you're shooting a wedding, work a little bit within that tradition. So um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't throw it away. I asked that question, or did I do something? Hold on. <laughs> so uh, the next. Uh, we we found three elements of a great photo, right? Uh, knowing your camera, um, being honest, and creating a good relationship with your uh, subject, right? So when you know you shot, you, you took a great picture. What do you do? You send that picture to the contests. <laughs> you keep you keep that picture for yourself. You give it to the clients. What else? I'm just really interested to know, just from people here. When you've taken, and you know, you know that beautiful golden moment when you're working through a wedding day and six hours in, you capture something and everything just came together at once. Whether you meant for it to happen or whether it was a happy accident. Um, do you run to your photographer friends and show them quickly? Because <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> I stop at the moment, there could be another hundred moments, but I'm really excited. I might have to run and shoot Harry as well. I've got Harry's Harry's here. So yeah, and straight away, yeah. So you, you, you feel you do, you, you, you've taken a great picture during the event. You know that looking at your camera, you rate it and you go back home. I know it before it's, I, I know it before I looked at it. I know if there's something there that I was present for and something that I've captured well. I, I know I don't have to look at it, I know it's there on the camera, so I don't, 
I'll have a quick look and then I will run and show you. And if I'm really excited, I'll probably show you a couple too. Okay, you, you said speed is one of your um, advantages, okay? So because speed is one of your advantages, you find any other great pictures when you go back home and start select when you start to select your pictures, or you know your great pictures during the event. Yeah. So what I just said about running away and showing one picture—that's the exception. I don't do that with every image. Most of the time, I never ever review my work while I'm shooting. I carry on shooting. Otherwise, you do become disconnected from the moment. And the second you're disconnected, it's lost. You go. Um, you, your mindset is out of it. Um, you switch off. You lose what's happening in front of you, and that's it. The game's over for you for the next 10 minutes, 15 minutes, until you're present again in the moment. So. As a rule, I don't really look at anything while I'm shooting. So yeah, I do find, I, I look through when I'm culling, and I find images um, which I'm really, really happy with. What, what is the importance of sending pictures to contests, winning awards, uh, being famous? What, what is the importance of? We're still with the last one. Winning contests. Does anyone, just put your hand up if you know who I am. Right, there we go. So we're not famous, it's not about being famous. Um, I think awards are, have their place. I think they're important. I think they're important to learn from. You can learn from other people who win awards and who enter competitions, and from the ones who don't. It constantly pushes you, not to, just to produce good work, which is why we're all here today talking about what makes a good photo, but to go beyond that and make great work, or exceptional work, or transcend the way in which you are creating at all. So I think awards have their place, their place in that. Um, I used I've entered awards for years. It used to be about my ego, and now it's I still enter them. It's more out of habit than anything. He's so he's lost his question. I'll ask him one. I still have one more question. <laughs> so uh, after we can take some some questions from the audience. Okay. That's a hint to start thinking of some questions, by the way. <laughs> um, so the last question was like, um, how? How do you feel when you are not winning? What's, what's your feeling? And what do you do after? Yeah, so on a, a wedding day, it's just not going right. So, it could be anything, it could be logistics. It could be the couple that turned out to be incompatible with me and I just didn't realize. Um, I haven't done my homework. The guests are not doing what you hope them to do. Um, my expectation of what I wanted from that wedding is not being fulfilled. There physically isn't anything going on. People are just sitting around doing nothing for most of the day, from bridal prep right the way through the ceremony. Everyone just sits down doing nothing. Their faces show no emotion. No matter how hard we work, there's nothing really there. And it's so frustrating. Um, and you'll be working with your photographer pal, and you, you know what it's like. You look at each other across the room. And, <laughs> And there's just nothing there. And they're looking at you as well, thinking, shit, there's just nothing going on. What are we going to do? How are we going to deliver this wedding? And I think that's when you need to really start drilling down. You need to get closer. You need to start infiltrating all the little groups and moments and trying to work and find something. And if, there's, if there really is nothing, sometimes there just isn't, then you start looking for pretty bits of light. <laughs> um, you start hunting for light or interesting abstract compositions. Um, or you find that you've got 70 photographs of a wedding cake. Um, nice. so, <laughs> except, except feeding your ego, um, winning awards helped your business in the past? I think there are two things. There, there are only two reasons I'm standing here today. One is because I've got some awards, and the other one is because I photographed a royal wedding very lately. <laughs> Did I mention I photographed a royal wedding lately? <laughs> so, um, you, you mentioned something about shooting uh, a royal wedding. How was your experience being there with uh, people you've only seen on TV or maybe on the street taking hands? And, so how, how is to be close to such a remarkable people? Um, as I, I'm, I'm going to use this, isn't going out to children, is it? Um, as I said at WebCamp, um, they still plead in shit like the rest of us. <laughs> so they're still human beings, they're normal. <laughs> So, they're normal people and they want normal things. It was a beautiful family wedding. They just happened to own the venue. And, <laughs> and there was a lot of security. Um, 
But beyond that, it was just a normal wedding. So my approach to it was exactly the same as I would photograph any other wedding. Um, it was a privilege to be there, it was a privilege to ask to be there, and I treated them the same as I would any other couple. Okay, Rich, thank you very much. Uh, o să luăm câteva întrebări din sală. Cine, cine vrea să înceapă? Sorry for my English. Sorry for my Romanian. <laughs> uh, what is your usual camera setup? Oh yes, yeah, I forgot to mention, to take good images you need a really good camera. <laughs> I've, I, I'll use anything to be honest. Uh, I'm happy with any camera, model, make or brand. But I really do like Nikon D850s. I shoot in manual almost all day. Um, I make small adjustments to, to things as I go along, depending on what I'm trying to achieve. Um, I actually don't know how to use a lot of the other settings on the camera apart from manual, so I'm a bit stuck. So <laughs> there's a P mode on it, that's supposed to be really good. I don't really know what that does. <laughs> uh, and your uh, focal length? Focal length, okay. So, I, I love gear. I love gear because boys love gear, and I'm a boy. So I bought all the lenses, and I use maybe two of them. <laughs> But if I need them, I can. so church ceremonies, you might need 70 to 200 if the vicar's an arse and won't let you get close to them. Um, I'm really, I have a two camera set up, so I shoot with two 850s, and I have one in reserve. And also because of my ego, I also carry a Nikon F2 for a couple of rolls of film. And uh, 3585, I use the, the Nikon uh, 1.8 lenses because they're light, because they're fast to move with. Um, and I can, movement and speed to me is important. I need to be able to drop to the ground to capture some crazy dancing or, it makes me less paranoid about the expense of the equipment too, because they're cheap lenses. So I can, I'm happy to throw the cameras around and put them where I need them or, or try and experiment with things. I'm not, I don't become precious about my equipment. How do you give uh, the price to your clients? I just say to them, how do I give the price to my clients? <laughs> yes, like, uh, because sometimes... At the data post, they concentrate on the data price. The chain of the data, because the data, the sum of the data, the sum of the data, the sum of the data, cum prezintă oferta. Adică avem câteodată clienți care nu pun așa mare preț pe preț. Nu trebuie ceva ieftin, sunt mai multe tipuri de clienți, da? Sunt cei care sunt vor ceva la fotografie, sunt cei care vor ceva mai How, how do you present your prices to your clients? Because you said uh, there are some clients that are only looking for a price, there are some clients that are coming to you only because you, they know you, you are good, you have awards. Uh, okay, how do I price my work? I am completely visible, you can go on my website and see my prices. Uh, apart from my destination ones, which are very expensive. So when my clients speak to me, um, and they say, how much are you? I say, that's the price. And then they say, oh, can we have a discount? And I say, Yeah, no problem at all. What do you want me to take? Should I just leave my cameras at home? You know, I can, I can chop it down to almost nothing if you like. We can get down to like $100. Would you like that? I said, I can get rid of my, my photographer friend second. I can take the cameras away. Um, I don't know, we can't stay overnight. We'll be completely exhausted because we won't have a hotel, but you know, so the photos will be shit. But we can get it right down to almost nothing. Or I can do a proper job for you. I can capture the emotions, the stories, the moments that will last you and your family, and maybe if, if you're blessed with children, a lifetime. And if that's important to you, then I'm your man. And if it's not, if you're price sensitive, that's fine, because there is, there is a part of the market for everybody. You know, it's not just, you don't just have to be at a certain level. Um, then that's fine too. But I have decided that that's where I am, and I do a hell of a job, and I deliver beautiful, finely edited images, and, and if they want me to do that, as opposed to someone else, then that's what it costs. I do say, you, you can, <laughs> I'm going to say this, you can have a McDonald's for your wedding breakfast, or you can have Gordon fucking Ramsay, okay? <laughs> and, I'm Gordon, and I'm Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> is, that, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. Uh, how, what's the biggest number of uh, players in your team? How many people did you go? 
So I'll bring the number of people that I need for the wedding. So uh, New Year's Eve, two years ago, we had three people. So I'll just bring whoever I need. Okay, uh, I want to ask you something. Uh, if in Britain is uh, a custom to make a wedding and a black ties, what is in the same? If, if in the United Kingdom you shoot like a christening or a baptism and a wedding in the same time, because in Romania people organize their weddings after they get yeah, after the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you basically shoot two events in one day. Like I, I usually go to a wedding party and uh, they say to me, we have a baptize. Uh, and uh, after the wedding. <laughs> oh, what you mean? The, uh, yeah? That's it. I do it, but that's extra. Yeah. No, no, in the UK I've never heard of that where you have a baptism. I think, what is it? They're trying to get really good value from yes, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Shit. Very good shit. <laughs> shit, no. Sorry for my English. That's okay. Don't worry. No, I've never heard of that. I don't think that, not to my knowledge, that exists in the UK. Um, I, I don't think I'd have, I've had lots of pregnant brides. They never, they never wanted me to baptise their child in the same way. Their first. Yeah, that's the Romanian way, maybe. And the uh, Romanian way also has a civilian wedding and a church wedding in the same day. Yeah, I don't think really. We, we, it's either one or the other, general, generally in the UK. Yeah. And uh, you see about the Romanian weddings, they're lasting uh, a lot of time. Uh, we go to the civilian wedding in uh, 10, morning, 10 hours, and uh, we finish about 5 or 4 uh, in the next morning. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> And if you want to go, they say, no, 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 I pay you for this. Oh, no, that's different. Yeah, yeah, they're paying. Yeah, I'm staying. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not shooting nothing. I'm shooting nothing. But they stay. Yeah. Because they want to stay. Oh, no, no, I, I was curious in uh, Britain is the, the same. So you're staying for free? <laughs> for uh, to take money from the client. If they're paying, yeah, ask. Yeah. So if there's money, yeah. No, no, no. They okay, don't give you the money for the ceremony and for the job to, because uh, they, are, uh, you can, they cannot pay you after, uh, uh, only after the uh, event. Are they paying after the event? Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Uh, what, from the guests? So you... <laughs> That the guests might give them enough money to pay you. Yes, something like this. Yeah, good luck with that. I don't think, I honestly, I mean. I was in a Yeah, I, he's, he's, paid, he's paid before the wedding. Every, every single penny before, is paid two weeks before the day for my weddings. I'm, I'm not coming to your wedding without, um, without being paid. Um, that's non negotiable. <laughs> Was that the human pyramid? Are you there? <laughs> um, I, would I would like to ask you if you start um, the photography journey today, what would you do differently? Okay, what would I do differently if I started today? I would make sure I knew how to use my equipment before I started photographing the wedding. If this is honestly, because I didn't, I didn't really know how to use my equipment. I had substandard equipment, I had rubbish equipment really. I didn't second shoot for anyone, I just ran out the door and started photographing weddings, cheap weddings, lots of cheap weddings, and so I wouldn't do that. So my advice would be, find someone who will take you along so you can learn the craft. So find a photographer friend who you can work for. Do it lots, shoot lots, try and learn, learn editing post-production. And when you've learned your craft, you've then got to learn a whole other set of skills, which is about business. Because 
you can't survive without it. You need to be able to earn money. You need to be able to attract clients and to bring business in. However much like me you hate doing that bit of it, you've got to become really good at it. So those are my two bits of advice. Get good at your equipment. Look, three actually. Get good with your equipment. Second, shoot for someone. Someone who's good as well. Not just someone who you don't really like because you're not getting experience. You won't learn anything. And number three, get really good at business. And don't compromise. Get good at it fast. It's okay. Second shooting influenced you maybe in a better way because if you start a second shoot or somebody else, maybe you can't, you, you can't find your uh, own style. No, I don't think that's the case. Um, I had um, a second shooter called Claire who used to work in a studio. She used to photograph babies in a mall. Now, I saw Claire and I photographed her wedding. And everybody loves Claire. She is hugely personable. If I brought her in now, you'd all be smiling, she'd be saying hello, she'd be sitting with you, she'd be chatting with you. She's so lovely. She was a shit photographer. She was awful. But I knew that she had masses of potential. And I said to Claire, would you like to shoot a wedding with me? And Claire said yes. And I took her to one, and then I took her to two and three and four. And after three years, she did become like a little mini me. She was copying me and emulating me and learning from me. And now, I told her in six months' time, this was two years ago, I said in six months' time, we are not going to work together anymore because I want you to do your own thing. I want you to find your own way now. You've got the tools, you've got the experience, you've got the portfolio, now go out there and do it. And that she has, and her work is different now. So she has become her own person, her own photographer. Her husband said to me, Rich, her confidence has gone through the roof. She never used to even like to get close with people. So I made her shoot with a 50mm lens for six months. Nothing else. So she had to get close. She didn't want to talk to people to arrange groups. So I made her do that for a couple of months. She had to stand up in front of 200 people and tell them what she wanted them to do. So I think that second shooting as a way of learning is hugely valuable on the journey to finding your own way.